So let's start with the <clears throat> sessions. And uh, first up, uh, we will start with the rules session. And uh, I will ask the IUF Rules Commission Chairman, David Rosen, to talk about the latest rules changes and some other interesting stuff. David. Good morning, Aaron, and good morning, everybody around the world. I see we have a very good turnout. I'm going to try and share my screen. So we'll see if that works. It's OK, David, we, we see your screen. OK, I'm just starting my uh, slideshow. OK, so I think you should see my first slide now. And yes. uh, as Aaron says, I'm chair of the IOF Rules Commission, and I've been asked to give a talk on the latest rule changes. Something about winning times, and as I'll mention, that's mainly been provided by Graham Griswood. I'll say something about major events in 2021 and event reports, a small session on that. And then there'll be room for questions, but also I'm happy to take questions as we go along. So maybe Aaron, if you spot any hands going up, you can help me with that. So there will be some new photo rules valid from the 1st of January 2022 and I'll be going through the changes that are being introduced. And there's the same date for the MTBO SKIO and oh well actually the SKIO are from the 1st of December. Uh, so it's not quite the same date, but there's the Trello rules as well. But it's important to note uh, when you listen to what I'm saying that they're being considered by IOF Council at their meeting next weekend. And they'll then be published towards the end of November. And IOF Council haven't fully approved them yet. So it won't be until they're published that you can be absolutely sure that what I'm presenting as changes are actually going to happen. So the first change I'm going to mention is something that's uh, throughout the rules. Very great use is made in the rules up to now of the word shall. And that's sometimes understood as a recommendation rather than a definite command. In English, it can have several meanings depending on the context and must is clearer. So there are hundred, literally hundreds of places in the rules where shall occurs. So mainly it's been changed to must to make it clearer. So here's an example. Uh, compulsory routes, crossing points and passages shall be marked clearly on the ground, on the map and on the ground. Competitors shall follow the entire length of any marked section of their course. And that is just changed to uh, replace shall by must because it's clear that uh, these things must happen. But sometimes uh, must isn't quite so appropriate. The jury shall consist of three voting members, if possible, from different federations at world ranking events. Well, that's just something that's going to happen. So, uh, and therefore, we can just get rid of shall and we just make it as a statement of what's happening. The jury consists of three voting members. Now, something that's being introduced is an under 23 class for World Championships and for the World Cup. 
but for the present it's just for mountain bike and skio not for photo or trello it's intended to encourage younger competitors who are transitioning from the junior to senior classes and the idea is that there should be very little extra work for the organizer there are two extra entry slots in some competitions for under 23 competitors but the uh, those competitors compete on the same course as all the other competitors in fact they're treated just like the other competitors and it's only in the results that they appear in separate results and separate world cup scoring as well as in the overall results so most of the work is just a little extra in producing an extra set of results so as i say this is a sort of experiment uh, in MTBO and SKIO and I know those commissions are very keen on it and it may be that in the future it will be introduced in FUTO. Most of what I'm saying today applies to FUTO but I, I know we've probably got some MTBO and SKIO people who perhaps do FUTO as well and so there will be the odd mention of those uh, disciplines. So another is, thing, is that, we have yes. the hand raised by Brigitte Gruniger Huber. Brigitte. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, just a question about these rule changes. Um, is it so that for for FUTO, I don't know about MTBO and SKIO, but uh, can we change the rules just by the rule commission and then it goes to confirmation at the council or does it have to go through the president or the, the assembly? Oh, thanks very much for that question. Uh, the the uh, process is that it, it does not have to go through assembly. It's the IOF council who makes the decision. Um, but you, you mentioned that it, the Rules Commission puts it forward. In fact, uh, obviously, the Rules Commission works very closely with the Discipline Commissions. And so I yesterday actually just sent the uh, the rules, the, the new versions of the rules off to Tom Hollowell to distribute to the council members for their consideration. And I did that in association with the uh, each discipline chair who I've been working with over the last months to try and come up with a final version. Is that OK? Yeah, just to raise the question, if that would happen in the foot or I mean, uh, would you consult? Uh, that's maybe a question to Aaron, like all the federations first or how would you go forward? <laughs> No, normally we don't consult uh, federations and organizers because uh, uh, mostly the rule changes we are making is uh, are a consequence of what we have seen in the previous years in uh, in some competitions. But if some strategic decision would be made like this uh, under 23 class, that would for sure be consulted by by others. Mm -hmm. This is something that we we don't see how it would work, so we obviously need some consultation. But uh, you will see some of the rule changes that David will uh, talk about. It's it's most, mostly the consequences of uh, of the events of uh, 2021. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that so, question. Another question by Jürgen Mortensen. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Well, uh, for me, uh, it sounds uh, it can be some strange uh, uh, if the winner uh, in in that course will be the under 23. What will happen then? Will it be uh, if that winner also have the best time for all competitors? It sounds a bit strange if uh, if that happens. Should it be also the winner of the 
senior class. Probably not, but then it's a bit strange for me. So that's uh, just what I would like to hear your opinion about. Yes, uh, thank you, Jorgen. I, I can absolutely answer that. Uh, if uh, I think as maybe happened in the Swedish World Cup, uh, an under 23 competitor wins the the uh, course, then they are both the, uh, the senior winner and also the under 23 winner. Um, so as you can see on the slide, the under 23 competitors compete on the same course as all the other competitors and they appear in the overall results. So I hope that is that OK, Jorgen? So basically he wins sure. uh, the senior class also and the under 23 class also, so both classes. That's right. OK, thank you. <clears throat> so another question by Kjell Sönixen. Just a, just a comment for, for that rule. I don't think there are many uh, event ad, uh, administrative um, systems that can operate with uh, uh, runners uh, competing in two classes at the same time. I, I imagine, <laughs> I know there was some discussion about this point, uh, but um, I, I imagine that um, IOF Eventor will have to be upgraded slightly to, to show this correctly. Yes, we will have a presentation about Eventor later, and Kel, you can ask that question from Henrik uh, Skoglund also. It was not Eventor, it's in, in, in the field. If you need a result list for uh, for the elite class and U23 class with the same competitors at the same time. Well, minor detail. Yeah. <laughs> OK, I mean, that's a good example of, of why it's being trialled at the moment in MTBO and SKIO and, and not yet in, in FUTO, where maybe there would be more pressure. So another change for uh, just for MTBO and SKIO is that they're simplifying start draws. Um, up to now, they've had quite complicated systems of orange groups and red groups and long rules about how you qualify for those groups. And obviously those groups started towards the end um, or in a mass start, they start on the front line. But now they've decided to simplify that because they, they found that organisers really struggled to prepare the start draws correctly. And then that led to complaints and the, the start list having to be changed at the last minute, which is always very uh, difficult for everybody. So the start draws for the Senior World Championships and World Cup are now simply based on world rankings randomized in three or four groups and in, in obviously in the junior world championships where they they don't necessarily have world ranking points then the team leaders will just uh, choose uh, start groups for their their team members and then the the runners or the, the skiers or the riders will be randomized within those groups but all much simpler than the previous method. And another simplification is that they've uh, removed all the rules relating to qualification races because actually uh, they're not needed in MTBO and SKIO. Their numbers, the numbers of competitors are a bit smaller than in FUTO and where they are larger, they, they have uh, rules to uh, limit the field. So many of you will be aware that the IOF has had a fair play project. After some issues at the World Cup in 2019, uh, the IOF set up this project. And over the, the last 18 months or so, the IOF 
fair play working groups have been meeting. And the outcomes have been a set of fair play principles for athletes, for team officials, organisers, spectators and media. They're just one page documents. Also, new guidelines to improve the application of some of the rules relating to fair play, and I'll talk a bit about those, some of those later. And some changes to the rules to clarify or improve them. In fact, I, I'm very pleased that the rules stood up pretty well to quite a lot of scrutiny and the rule changes as a result of this project are, are, are rather small, but we'll, we'll show you what they are. There are also, I think, going to be some online resources, uh, I think, for athletes so that they can uh, do, a ses do sessions online to understand uh, fair play, because the concept of fair play, I think we thought in in Western Europe or Scandinavia was very well understood, but it became clear that it's uh, not quite so well understood across the world. So here's one small um, item that came out of the Fair Play project. We had a rule saying that uh, out of bounds or dangerous areas or forbidden routes, line features that shall not be crossed, shall be marked on the map and if necessary they should also be marked on the ground and it wasn't quite clear what to everybody what if necessary means so we've just clarified that slightly to say where they're not obvious to the competitor they must also be marked on the ground so that that might be for example where you've got a piece of grass which in most of the competition area you can run across uh, but in this particular bit of grass, uh, you mustn't run across. And although it's marked, it maybe marked in, maybe marked in olive green on the uh, on the map. It also needs marking uh, with tapes on the ground. Uh, I'm sort of going through in order um, of the. I think someone maybe needs to mute that. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm sort of going through in order uh, through the rules. So the fair play uh, changes will come up um, as we go through them. Um, so the next little change is about control proximity. And, and uh, Begita was asking where uh, how the rule changes come up and um, from time to time people write to us to say that uh, the something's wrong with the rules. We're, we're very happy to hear uh, from anybody, particularly from event advisors, uh, where you think there's problems with the rules. And I think s somebody wrote to us to say that uh, they weren't quite clear about the control proximity rules. And when we looked at them, we realised that we had some text which was only in the appendix uh, about control proximity. Um, and that was about where the control features are similar um, to each other uh, or look similar uh, when you get there. Um, and Normally, when you've got two different control features, then the minimum running distance between controls is 25 metres. Uh, sorry, is in the forest, the uh, minimum distance is 30 metres. Uh, in sprint, it's slightly different. It's 25 metres minimum running distance and 15 metres minimum straight line distance. But if the features are similar, then the minimum straight line distance between controls is 60 metres or 30 metres for sprint. So as I said, um, that red text was only stated in the appendix and it wasn't clear whether that was a rule or not. So now we've made that a rule as well. 
and the appendix and the uh, rule 19.4 are now completely consistent. And you'll, you'll notice that there's this funny um, discrepancy that for sprint, the minimum distance um, is expressed as a running distance of 25 metres minimum or a straight line distance of 15 metres. And we've explained that a bit more in the appendix. Um, the point is that it's essential that an athlete knows that the electronic feedback is from the control they've just visited and not from one that they've recently punched either deliberately or accidentally just because they went close to it. Um, this is a particular issue with contactless punching with the SIAX or a touch free e emit. And so we had a discussion about this a, a few years ago, you might remember, and the minimum running distance between controls uh, is 25 meters in order to ensure that if you've punched the control, then your e card will have stopped flashing uh, by the time you get to the next one. OK. A problem on the course should be fixed as soon as possible. I've often heard it said that uh, when somebody's perhaps one of the early runners has come back and said, oh, there's a problem with the control, it's in the wrong place. There's then a discussion about whether you should leave it where it is so as to have the same problem for all the other runners. And that the idea is that would make it fair or whether someone should nip out and fix it as quickly as possible. And to clarify that, we've added in a new rule to all the disciplines to say that if during the race the organiser is made aware of a problem with a control or a course, such as a failed punching unit, incorrect positioning of a control unit or a blocked passageway, the organiser should make every effort to correct the problem as quickly as possible. And then after the race has ended, the organiser must consider the effect of the problem on the fairness of the results and take any necessary action, which might include voiding the results. So that should clarify that you do need to fix it as quickly as possible. And that will mean that at least the later runners won't encounter this problem. And sometimes we, we organise events in such a way that actually the earliest runners, although obviously we'd like everybody not to have a problem, uh, the earliest runners are not going to be the medal winners. Um, and so if they encounter a problem, it's not quite as much difficulty as if the, the later runners do. <clears throat> Again, of course, uh, that didn't apply in the uh, Swedish women's middle distance uh, World Cup event where the, the first person off was the overall winner. OK, um, we've been working over the years on the definition of telecommunication devices and as you can imagine, we've had to keep reviewing the rules as watches and GPS and everything got uh, cleverer and cleverer. And previously, we had a rule that competitors must not use or carry telecommunication devices uh, between entering the quarantine, quarantine zone and reaching the finish. Um, but on advice from the IT Commission, we've changed that wording slightly to communication devices that can transmit or receive information to or from a remote source. Now, in World Masters, Regional Championships and World Ranking events in FUTO, competitors are allowed to carry their own GPS watch provided they have no map display 
no communication ability other than receiving GPS data and that they're not used for navigation purposes. However, if for some reason the organiser feels that GPS watches should be uh, banned, then the organiser has the right to ban them. And of course, the organiser might require competitors to carry a tracking device on, on their back. Now, in contrast, at the higher, highest level events, World Championships, Junior World Championships and World Cup, we've got roughly the same rule, except that competitors are not allowed to carry their own uh, watches. I think in skio and um, mountain bike, it's actually slightly more flexible and uh, competitors are allowed to carry their uh, own uh, watches even in the highest level events. But in FUTO, uh, where the, there's the most media interest, it often it would seem a bit strange if people were wearing their own watches and the public would assume that they could then uh, work out where they were at any time. I, I should just mention that we are aware of an issue with this. Um, which is that sometimes the organiser issues GPS enabled devices, uh, sorry, issues GPS trackers um, for the competitors to wear, but doesn't have enough for all the competitors. And that means that some of the competitors, those who get given the trackers, end up with a track. But the other competitors don't end up with the track and, and that's seen as a bit unfair. Um, so uh, I think, think this might be considered further in future. Another fair play. Uh, David? Uh, yes. Sorry, David, we have a question from Alexei Alexeyanok. Good. Alexei? Uh, yes, uh, hello everybody. I would just uh, say some words about GPS uh, watches. And as you s mentioned here, uh, uh, it will be totally forbidden for major uh, events, but for uh, world ranking uh, events, it uh, can be applied uh, for uh, competitors to take uh, their own uh, GPS watches without any uh, information transmission here. Yeah. But um, I remember good practice when uh, uh, before the start, um, organizers provided some tape, to tape around the watches. Uh, can we make some uh, advices maybe for World Marketing event to be uh, more simple for uh, for competitors to use their own uh, GPS uh, devices. So, what was the purpose of the tape? Is it because the, the... Uh, because I I I mean uh, the most uh, models of uh, GPS watches. Uh, are able to show some information like height, uh, length, and so on. Of course, uh, user can switch off all this data from the monitor, from the display, and uh, to switch this uh, data on, you have to stop, you have to uh, change properties uh, and on your device uh, during the day. So it's not uh, convenient but it can be made. If someone really wants to uh, break these uh, fair play rules and uh, get some GPS, uh, GPS uh, data. But to be maybe more clear in this situation, we put tape on, on watch uh, before the race and check uh, on the finish that the tape is still there. Maybe it, uh, it, uh, it's just advice. I, I, I'm just remember this, 
uh, such situation uh, before some years ago when the first time gps watches uh, came to the rules and the uh, organizers became uh, uh, organizers uh, started to think about this and uh, started to make some some uh, actions with uh, with this yes th thank you um i i know that uh standard gps watches um usually do show distance um and and i think the photo commission have discussed that and although potentially that can be of some assistance to a runner i think we've decided that it's not really um that significant and so i don't think it's necessary to go to the extent of uh, taping displays over. I think the the critical thing is no map display uh, because if you've got a map display, obviously if you're lost, you can, especially if you've got an old copy of the map downloaded or something, you can uh, immediately see where you are. And so my, my feeling is that a, a watch with map display should not be allowed and you shouldn't even you, sh you shouldn't just uh, tape it over um, because uh, obviously if someone was really desperate to find out where they are they could take the tape off and put it back again afterwards uh, I don't know whether Aaron have you got any comments about that I, I have I still have comments <laughs> yeah but uh, carry on carry on Alexei yeah okay okay uh, yes, uh, of course, the uh, map displaying is uh, harmful in this situation and uh, it uh, should be totally uh, forbid uh, to use such dis uh, such displays and such uh, devices. But uh, uh, if we uh, talk about some devices are allowed to use, some devices are not allowed, uh, should we prepare the model list <laughs> or how to to find out for for uh, organizers in the start area to check this out do we need to put some extra uh, power to check this or yeah we have to think about this uh, also and uh, yeah of course for me as a comp competitor i i really agree with you that length or maybe height uh, difference uh, is not so really helpful while running you will faster get lost <laughs> if you will check it <laughs> but uh, yeah the map display is of course um, really important to to block this option uh, thank you very much and uh, i hope uh, this uh, gps device uh, rules will be very clear and uh, simple to use both for organizers and uh, competitors <clears throat> okay thank you i guess eduardo tona has an answer for you yes hi david only a minor consideration about the usage of gps world gps is actually the american system and uh, at the moment the new devices are able to connect also to russian satellite european galileo system chinese one and the right word to describe all this system or any of them is GNSS, which stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. It's only minor consideration, but since the watch uh, is allowed to receive GPS data, uh, they should be allowed also to receive uh, GLONASS, um, by the Galileo data. It's only minor consideration because in, in the rules, wars are important. I, I will send you an email, David, if you want, with the right acronyms. Okay, uh, thanks for thanks very much for that. Um, I, I think we we probably missed the deadline for these coming rule changes. And I think we need to think uh, about what's easiest for people to understand. Um, I think fewer people, fewer members of the public 
will know what you mean if you talk about GNSS at the moment. Uh, maybe that will change, but uh, certainly it's something we, we will think about. Um, for, for the future version, you can write uh, 2023 rules, uh, GNSS, uh, and then uh, an example, uh, GPS and, and other system. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. <coughs> so as I said, um, there was a lot of discussion in the Fair Play project working groups about quarantine zones. And the previous definition has actually stood up pretty well. And we just added in um, a, a definition of quarantine zone as a secure area where communication with the outside world by any person in the quarantine zone is forbidden except for officials authorised to do so by the event organiser. I mean, I know that uh, quarantine zones are uh, much less common in world ranking events. They're, they're more normally used in high level events. Again, a very small change uh, in the fair play, the basic fair play rule. Um, the, the Previous rule, which we've had for many years, says uh, that competitors shall have a sporting attitude and a spirit of friendship. And some people felt that sporting attitude wasn't understood in all nations in the same way. So we, we've just eliminated that. And it now says all persons taking part in an orienteering event must behave with fairness honesty and the spirit of friendship. We've actually very recently been discussing results and we're just introducing a very basic and simple new rule, which actually just reflects uh, standard practice, I think. The first point about results is that competitors who correctly compete, complete the course are placed in order in the results. Those who fail to correctly complete the course are shown at the end of the results with no placing and with a reason, e.g. mispunched, retired or disqualified. One of the reasons we've put that in, and it will become clear in the next few slides, um, is that there's a feeling that we should distinguish between disqualified, which has some rather bad connotations indicating that the competitor has misbehaved um, and maybe shouldn't normally be used for an orienteering mistake, such as punching the wrong control. But of course, there isn't really a clear dividing line between uh, doing something bad and just making a mistake. Um, for example, a competitor might run across an out of bounds area deliberately to save time or might do so accidentally because they weren't looking at the map carefully enough. And, you know, when you're running as fast as you can, um, you sometimes don't pick up everything on the map. And whether that's a, a deliberate action or a, an accident, it's it's not quite clear. I'm sure we've all done things when we were in a when we were competing hard um, where we, we realized we shouldn't have done done that thing. So I don't think we can have a we, we can't uh, stop using the term disqualified um, completely for what might be orienteering mistakes, but we, we're going to try and reserve it more for um, Case, whoops, cases where the competitor um, has done something wrong. So when referring to mispunching, uh, the rules now talk about must not be placed if they've mispunched rather than must be disqualified. <clears throat> David, we have a question from Yan Wen Chen. Yes, Yan. Can you unmute your microphone?
Probably it was just raised hand by mistake. Carry on, David. Okay, thank you. So uh, while we were thinking about the way that results should be shown, uh, you probably know that in relays, federations can sometimes enter more than one team. Um, sorry, I've just, oh yes. So in FUTO, that applies in the Junior World Championships and in MTBO and SKIO, uh, you can enter more than one team even in World Championships and World Cup relays. So the current rule says that if a federation is represented by two teams in a relay class, only the team with the better result is considered in determining the placings. And we've added a new second sentence to say the results show all the teams in finishing order, but the second team from Federation does not have a placing. So it wasn't quite clear what you should do about those second teams, uh, whether you should put them up with the others or down at the bottom. So here's an example. Um, Norway 2 came in in the lead. Norway one was next across the line, then Finland one, and then Sweden two. And so this is the way the result should look, because uh, you don't want to put Norway one right down at the bottom with the missed punches, uh, but uh, you put them in the second place, but without a placing. And I think generally that, generally that just reflects the way that uh, we've done things up to now. It's not really a change. Sorry, David, Blair Truin has a comment. Uh, yes, just uh, noting that uh, uh, in uh, some World Cup races, you can have more than two teams from uh, from a country. Uh, uh, so you may want to consider uh, as saying the second and subsequent team, or words to that effect. Yes, actually, thank you, Blair. Uh, <laughs> certainly in... Um... In MTBO and SKIO, that is the case, uh, and uh, we, we do in say, indeed say second and subsequent teams. It, this particular rule uh, in FUTO is only a J rule, um, and it is limited to two teams. Uh, maybe um, you'll be the expert on this. I think usually we um, put rules about the relays for the World Cup in the World Cup special rules, don't we? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can, we can do that if necessary. Yeah, okay, but we'd certainly we can, we can look at that. Okay, we have two more raised hands, David. One from Brigitte Grüniger Huber. Uh, yeah, just one note. If it says uh, the second team has no placing, uh, isn't that a little bit weird? Because here, Norway too. The second team of Norway is in the first place. Should you say the faster team or something is in the results? Well, as I, I think it's pretty clear from the context because the first um, sentence, the, the, these yeah. two are, are just a, a single rule. And the, and the first sentence talks about only the team with the better result is considered in determining the placing. So I think that's clear. So then I think in that context, uh, the second team, it's obvious that it's the second across the line uh, from that federation. Mm. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Birgitta. Was there another question? That's right, from Gunther Smankus. Hi, everyone. Uh, I have one more question regarding this two team, uh, two one nation team participation in in uh, high level eleven events. Uh, in in a case if one team is disqualified because of break breaking, for example, quarantine, uh, how to do with a, an, another same nation's team in that case? Because we have similar situation here in local event for clubs, but it could be also on nation level. That if one team is disqualified, for example, because breaking of quarantine, should the other same nation's teams also must be disqualified because there was potentially some information exchange? Maybe that's, that needs to be clarified also somewhere in the rules. 
Uh, that is in the rules, and um, I think we might we might come across that rule um, if because um, there's a I can't remember whether it's in this presentation or not, but um, there's a rule that says um, if a, if if a rule is broken and the rule we're talking about is uh, adhering to quarantine, uh, the quarantine rule, if a rule is broken, then the competitor should be disqualified and also any competitors who benefited from the breaking of that rule. So it's clear if um, if other other uh, people in the, uh, other members of that federation's team might have benefited from the the breaking of that rule, then they too get disqualified. But it would depend on the the particular circumstances, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be automatic. <laughs> um, if, for example, somebody was late for their quarantine check-in and therefore wasn't allowed into the quarantine, doesn't mean that the rest of the team um, who were already in the quarantine need to be disqualified. Okay. okay thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, Blair is coming back with uh, with another comment, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, 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 picking up on producer's point, the wording we use in the World Cup special rules is uh, uh, that only the best place team will count in the results list. So we uh, in the World Cup special rules we say who does count rather than who does not count. OK, thank you, Blair. Now, one big part of the Fair Play project was to was thinking about the sanctions that should apply if Fair Play uh, was not followed. Um, oh, yes, I thought it was here. A competitor who breaks any rule or who benefits from the breaking of any rule may be disqualified. So this is in the fair play section and to a certain extent this this rule would be the one you point to where you disqualify someone in the past who hadn't punched all the controls uh, because there is a rule saying you need to punch all the controls in the correct order. Um, but as as I discussed earlier is that's not really a fair play issue is it that's just a or orienteering mistake and that's why in the results section we've introduced that new rule to say where people should appear in the results so now this really is talking about people who break a rule uh, and it's something to do with fair play um, so there are now a range of sanctions in, in addition to disqualification. There's a time penalty if you jump the start in a mass start format race. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. As disqualification as ever. And there's also suspension for com from competition for a defined period. Only by the disciplinary panel. So during the event, the event organiser, or if it's a protest, the jury, has responsibility for imposing sanctions, that is the time penalty or the disqualification. And outside of an event, the disciplinary panel has responsibility for imposing sanctions. Now, what is this disciplinary panel? Uh, We've already got in the IOF an ethics panel, and I think the ethics panel was asked if they wanted to take over this function and be also the disciplinary panel, but I think they said they didn't want to. So the IOF will be setting up a new disciplinary panel, um, which will deal with questions like this. So, there will be a guideline document published giving some guidance and examples about use of the new sanctions. 
Um, we had proposed, or it had been proposed, that there be a, a new sanction of warning. Uh, but it needs further consideration. Warnings are used very uh, frequently in some sports. For example, in football, there's a system of yellow cards. And I think in uh, cross-country skiing, in classic races, if you if you do the odd skating step, you might get a warning. And similarly, in race walking, if you almost break into a, a run and your both feet leave the ground, you get a warning. And you need a couple of warnings before you're actually disqualified. So I think it was quite a reasonable idea to think, should we have warnings in orienteering? But when we thought about it initially, um, we, we realised that warnings are perhaps more appropriate for contact sports, where it's easy to get just a bit too rough and <laughs> in your tackle or whatever. And, and also in sports where you have to um, move in a certain way, uh, either uh, classic skiing, for example, rather than skating. In orienteering, we, 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 it isn't really a contact sport and we don't mind how you run or uh, you can run in any style that you want. So when we tried to think of examples for the use of warnings, we couldn't really think of any. And we also realised that they probably would need quite a lot of bureaucracy behind them, because if someone gets warned in one world ranking event, how is the next world ranking event organiser to know that that person has had a warning? So I think that will be considered further before it comes into the rules. Uh, I'll, I'll just go back actually because uh, just a word about um, sanctions for for, for mass starts. Um, in I'll just go back to the previous page. There's a time penalty for jumping the start in a mass start format race. And in discussion with the Photo Commission, um, they felt it, that's not really a problem. Pe people are pretty good at um, waiting until the, the gun. In ski orienteering, it, it has it used to be quite a big problem. Uh, and you can imagine that in ski -o, it's quite an advantage to be first away and not have other people's skis and sticks interfering with you. So by introducing this rule in Skio, which they've had for a few years, um, and they've got a standard penalty of two minutes if anybody jumps the start, what they found is that they haven't had to use the rule, but it has completely eliminated the problem and that now nobody jumps the start anymore. Now, partly for consistency, this this has been introduced into uh, FUTO and MTBO, but we're not sure that it will be greatly used. And at the moment, there's no fixed time penalty in FUTO or MTBO. So if you did want to use it, you'd need to decide the appropriate time penalty uh, at the time. David, one question from Kelsey Nixon. Yeah, I just have a candidate for a warning that could be following another runner in the forest. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you, Kel. We've uh, had a lot, many hours spent on uh, following, uh, dis discussion of following and how to prevent following. Um, and the outcome has been that we, we feel that we can't either define nor completely ban following and that the um, it's really up to the organiser and the, the rules to try and prevent following by planning courses with plenty of route choice and by uh, having sufficiently large start times or gaffling or whatever 
to um, to make sure that uh, people in general don't follow. But yeah, it's. I think it, at the time uh, when we discussed it last, time penalties were discussed, and whether you could, if if you thought someone's following, you would hold them at a control uh, for. 30 seconds before letting them go again, uh, but I'm not sure that how practical that would be. Another candidate, David, may be uh, major physical contact in the knockout sprint competitions. Yes. This, yeah, this was raised in the athletes coaches meeting by one of the coaches, in fact, two weeks ago. OK, yes, maybe that is something to consider for the future. Maybe that is a, more of a contact sport than the, the other uh, formats of orienteering. Um, certainly before uh, before we had contactless punching, if, if you didn't put enough uh, electronic punches or pin punches at, a, at the first start control in a relay, that could have been considered a contact sport. But... Um, Hopefully we've eliminated that now, but maybe we've introduced it uh, with the knockout sprint again. I think something not for this year, but uh, for the future. Yeah, that's right. OK, uh, carry on, David. Sorry? Carry on, David. Yeah, OK, uh, just another point about the time penalty is that we did discuss whether time penalties could be used uh, for adjusting the results. For example, if someone took a short cut uh, across an outer bounds area because the or across a perhaps across a uh, an uncrossable wall where a gate was open that wasn't on the map. Um, but we've discussed it and decided that time penalties cannot be used in that way. If someone's gained an advantage um, by taking a short cut, for example, then they have to be disqualified, even if it wasn't entirely their sport. It just wouldn't be fair on the other competitors. Uh, it, yeah, it wasn't their fault. So um, a time penalty can only be used for jumping the start in a mass start format race. Just to mention of prior knowledge, we've got this rule. Uh, we haven't changed it. Uh, as an organiser must bar from the competition any competitor who is so well acquainted with the terrain or the map that the competitor would have a substantial advantage over other competitors. So this refers not particularly to breaking an embargo, because um, that, that would be separate. This refers more to people who perhaps um, live in the terrain or train in in the terrain in, in the past before the embargo was announced. And there will be a new guideline published to help organisers decide because it's it's a combination of factors such as uh, how much knowledge you had, how long ago it was, etc. And it also, although we've got the same rule for the four disciplines, it does vary from discipline to discipline because in in uh, Skio, for example, although you might know the terrain, they put in uh, special tracks for each competition. So there will be a new guideline document. OK, the next section is on winning times, and I'm grateful to Graham Griswood for providing this. There, there are uh rules about winning times which you're probably familiar with most of them as you see give a range and i won't go through them in detail but graham griswood has done an analysis of results from this year world championships and world cup and in the tables that follow red is unacceptable yellow is questionable and grey is OK. And you can see that he's got an, uh, a column for what the rules said and then what the bulletin said. Um, 
normally the rules and the bulletin should say the same thing. Uh, but surprisingly, in some places, the, the bulletins said different things. So you, probably there was a good reason for it. Um, but you can see that there's quite a bit. Whoop, beg your pardon. Let me go back. Uh, on this first table, we've got the European Championships in Switzerland and the World Cup in Sweden. And you can see there's quite a bit of red. And for example, in the sprint final in the European Championships, the winning times were 16 minutes, which was a bit long. In the World Cup in Sweden, the, the women's uh, winning time in the long was 88 minutes. Uh, in the middle distance in Sweden, the winning times were 39 and 40 minutes. And then in the relay, the overall time in Sweden for the women was 127 minutes compared with the 105 it should have been. And then Graham's also looked at the World Cup in Italy and the World Championships in the Czech Republic. And you can see that uh, again in the sprint relay in Italy, the winning time was nearly 65 minutes instead of 60. And in the World Championships in the Czech Republic, the middle distance events were the races were rather what well, rather long so does this matter so there were 34 senior international races this year 11 had unacceptable winning times and seven had questionable ones that's over half the races i that is graham does want to say that many were spot on and well done to them but there's a worrying trend for rules to be interpreted so that the top end is used. 30 to 35 means 35 minute winning time. And then you end up with a 39 minute time winning time when the course planner gets it wrong. Planners might think they're using, making the best possible courses and showing off the best terrain they can, but actually they're causing problems. It's especially an issue Graham seen for a few years in sprint, where almost every championship race decides that 15 minutes is the optimal winning time. So there's a 50% chance of being out of outside the 12 to 15 minute window because there's a 50% chance you'll be above the 15. So what's the reason that we're worried about this? TV coverage often has a very limited slot and they've factored in the time that the last person's going to finish. And in some competitions, um, Graham thinks the, the end of the competition was missed on the TV coverage. It, if the uh, winning time is 16 minutes for a sprint, that's something the athletes aren't prepared for. And there's a cumulative effect if you've got several races on the same day, and it's particularly relevant for knockout sprint. And you've also got the problem of getting dark, which I'll mention a bit later. And it's in the rules. So why might this have happened? Could be the event advisor doesn't look at the winning times or doesn't know the rules. The planning team doesn't follow the rules. Or the planning team thinks the long distance needs to be as long as possible and definitely doesn't want it to be too short. Maybe the planning team don't know how fast the best runners in the world are. And the terrain speed can depend on the weather. So if it's wet, then it can be heavier going. Normally, at a major event, even a world ranking event, you would try and have someone pre-run the course to check the distance. But you do need to know how 
good your pre-runners are compared to the top quality runners who will turn up for the event. And sometimes the event advisor won't challenge the planner for whatever reason. You've also got demands by TV um, or constraints due to the arena location, which might mean you've got to have, for example, a several minute long run in to get to get to the arena. So there are windows for a reason. If the guidelines say 12 to 15 minutes, then the target should always be 1330, not 15 minutes. Then if you're wrong, you've got a good chance of being in the guidelines. Being too short is rarely a problem. It's more that courses are too long. And with the brackets, there should be no excuse to miss them at all. And of course, what I was showing you, the, the, the winning times were for World Cup and World Championships, but uh, we, the same applies to Junior World Championships, World Masters, World Ranking Events, etc. Of course, there can be problems for planners which can't be eliminated, and we recognise that. You can't be sure who's going to turn up. For example, on a long distance course, if Tove runs and has a clean run, the winning women's winning time may be five minutes faster than otherwise. So thanks very much to Graham for that. So now I'm just going to go on to just have a look at a few incidents from major events this year. And before I get into that, I, I want to say that uh, I think the IOF has done pretty well to run its major event programme, despite all the the COVID problems. And the organisers of, of those events have done very well to put on very high quality events. And in fact, there were very few uh, cases in which the jury had to meet. So. I don't want that. I'm just picking up on a few interesting points from those events, but I don't want that to detract from uh, what was a really good job by those organisers. So, in the European Championships, an athlete was disqualified during the knockout sprint qualification for running through a forbidden area. The Swedish team complained about this decision. The organiser rejected the complaint. The Swedish team made a protest, arguing that the place was not clearly displayed on the map as a forbidden area. And the jury looked at it and unanimously rejected the protest and confirmed the organiser's decision after analysing the map. Then in the sprint relay, two athletes were disqualified for running through a prohibited area. Two complaints, uh, there were two different federations for those athletes, were made about the organisers' decision to disqualify those athletes. And the complaints were accepted by the organisers. So I don't really want to make a big point about this, uh, except that this just shows the complaint and protest working system, uh, the, the complaint and protest system working properly. Um, in in the first case, it went through to a protest and the jury considered it properly and uh, rejected the protest. In the second case, it didn't need to go to the jury. Um, there was something wrong, obviously, on the map and the, uh, the organiser accepted the complaint. So, I think the only other point to note is that in urban areas particularly, um, you need to be very careful as an organiser and planner to uh, make sure that it, the out of bounds areas are clear on the map and if necessary on the ground. So at the World Championships where the Czechs did very well to include both the forest events and the uh, sprint events in their program. Uh, as you all know, probably there was an issue with map protection because there was one very wet day. The maps were in plastic bags, but 
the runners were going through rather rough and rocky terrain and sometimes the map bag uh, tore and the map inside then started to disintegrate. I don't think I need to say any more on that because I think Krista Carlson in his uh, presentation later in this seminar will probably mention that. And then there was the issue of darkness um, and that's come up in our events before that uh, sometimes the later runners have found that because it's a particularly dim and perhaps wet day, uh, darkness falls a bit earlier than usual. And we've seen runners having to go out with head torches, even though it's supposed to be a, a day event. And obviously there's an element of unfairness comes in. So just to remind you that the event advisor this is a, one of the rules, must ensure the rules are followed, mistakes are avoided, and that fairness is paramount. And the event advisor has the authority to require adjustments to be made. And in particular, the event advisor often has to help resolve conflicts between the requirements of the media and the fairness of the competition. Now, if it's up to the media, um, who, if they don't understand orienteering, they'd like the competitors to all run the same way and to stay within range of as few cameras as possible. And obviously, uh, for a proper orienteering event, that isn't really um, possible. Uh, in the World Cup in Sweden, there were advertising hoardings. This is what they look like. You can see they're stuck into the ground. You can see the runners approaching and it's clear the uh, I don't know what the advertising hoardings look like from the back. They may have been black, but even so they would have made the position of the control much more obvious than the flag itself. So. It's important to main the, maintain the essence of the sport which is about not just running, but navigating and running through the terrain independently. And even in mass start and chasing start races, uh, the formats must still demand independent navigation. And we do that through gaffling and so on. And route choice. So finally, um, David. yes. David, uh, I have one comment here. Uh, I think we <coughs> we can uh, we can also say that this year we we tried one one new thing in our uh, jury mannings is that uh, in the Swedish World Cup and in the Italian World Cup one jury member acted remotely. In fact, it was you in Sweden and I was doing that that in Italy. And of course, there were no issues, so this worked fine. And uh, <clears throat> we intentionally tried these in uh, uh, events where it was where the competition, most of the competitions were uh, were in the forest. And uh, so far it worked and we may may want to try it for further forest competitions, I guess. OK, yes, thank you, Aaron. We, it it all it is always difficult to find independent jury members uh, who are going to be at a competition uh, and obviously that was particularly difficult this year with all the travel difficulties yeah thank you aaron so my final little topic is just on event reports just to remind you what reports are needed now, for all levels of event, not more than four weeks after the event, the event advisor must send a report to the event advisor appointing body. So for world ranking events, the event advisor appointing body is the uh, National Federation. And I know that sometimes national federations may, might not be that interested, but I think it's still good practice just to send a, a small report after the world ranking event uh, to to the national body. But for higher level events, 
the IOF Events Advisor appointing body is the IOF, and so the report should go to IOF office. And it should include any significant features of the event and details of any complaints or protests. And there is a nice template on the IOF website, uh, and I won't show it, show you it now, but if you click on that link, you can find the page where the template is. And that means you can just quick, very quickly fill in the, the report under the various headings. And some of them for a world rank event, some of them won't be uh, applicable. You can just uh, go straight past them. For the highest level events, World Championships, World Cup, Junior World Championships and Regional Championships, the organiser must forward a short report and send maps with course details to the IOF office. For World Masters, similarly, uh, the organiser must send a short report and a selection of maps, including all A final maps, to the IOF office. I think the the maps should actually still be in paper form or at least a selection of paper maps uh, because the IOF Map Commission is keen on looking at the quality of maps and if they just receive the maps in electronic format it's not clear uh, what the experience of the competitors was exactly in terms of map quality. And then for World Championships, there's a much more comprehensive report uh, needed uh, no more than six months after the event. So that's it from me. Are there any question, any further questions? We've only got a, a few minutes. Yes, thank you, David. And I see uh, one question from Alexei Alexeyanok. Uh, hello, one more time. I have a small comment about commercials on the World Cup in Sweden. The backside uh, of them were white and they were really clearly seen for the competitors really far from the control point. It was uh, yeah, clearly seen for us as uh, spectators from uh, web broadcast as well. Uh, and uh, what my question is about uh, PCR tests for coronavirus and uh, uh, I returned back to World Cup in Sweden. It was saying in bulletin that uh, all competitors should or have to pay for the PCR test and the price was uh, about 100 euro per, per test. Um, Fortunately, our Belarus uh, athletes uh, were not tested because they had uh, already um, valid uh, tests from uh, Estonia. They made uh, this test uh, on their trip. But how the price for obligatory PCR tests can be um, can correlate with the fair fairness and the fair play rules because uh, 100 euro for Belarus is a really high price. And I'm not saying uh, only for Belarus, but for most countries in the world. Uh, so that's a question of, from me. Can uh, organizers find a way to make this test uh, free for competitors or how? Can we eliminate this uh, difference? Thank you. OK, thanks very much for that question. I, th I think it's not really something that I've uh, I know a lot about the, the costs of, um, of tests and the the, the protocol for uh, running events during this period has really been managed by the IOF office, I think. Um, Obviously, it's something that's changing over the course of time. Um, and uh, you're, you're right that we do need to make it as fair for all competitors and not excessively expensive so that only the, the richest 
federations can participate. Have you got anything to add, Aaron? <clears throat> yes, we had a president's conference for uh, for the internet uh, for the national federations uh, presidents uh, three or four weeks ago, and then uh, there Tom Hollowell, the CEO of the IUF, announced that. Uh, this protocol will will somehow be changed, uh, like in some other sports, like uh, you can you can see in in biathlon and skiing and so on. And then from next year, this this will be changed, and uh, <clears throat> only athletes who are not vaccinated uh, will <clears throat> will need to to take tests. Vaccinated means that uh, you are vaccinated with. Uh, uh, one of the vaccines that are accepted by uh, <clears throat> by the World Health Organization, but uh, I guess some some more uh, guidelines about this will will come out in the next uh, few months and definitely before uh, the 2022 uh, photo season. Yeah. One Alexei? more comment. Yes, thank you. Uh, about vaccines, it's really nice to have them, and I'm happy to be vaccinated. But uh, at the same time, uh, the World uh, Health Organization is not uh, approve uh, every vaccine. Is uh, that is was uh, used. So for me, it's uh, like uh, Sputnik. We have. Um, we can uh, vaccinate it by Sputnik and the one of Chinese uh, vaccine. And uh, I don't really sure that uh, Chinese vaccine uh, also approved by uh, World Health Organization. So that's a good question to think about. <laughs> so, but I know that Sputnik works because uh, we have a lot of uh, good, uh, good uh, examples here in Belarus when uh, vaccinated uh, people haven't suffered anything about uh, COVID. Thank you. Yes, I can only advise you to to contact the IOF office about this. Uh, they are they are managing the situation and uh, we know that uh, they are trying to find a, a solution that is uh, that will be suitable for for most people. OK, thank you very much everybody for listening and uh, I hope to see you in the in the forest somewhere. I'll hand back to you Aaron. Yes, thank you David for an interesting session. I know that you were a bit worried about your session being uh, too short but you were spot on time and I know that you have something else to do in the next couple of hours so um, I would once again like to thank you for your contribution and have a nice time in the next uh, few hours. And then we will continue with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, the IT block. And in the IT block, we will have uh, uh, two presentations, one from Henning Spijakovic and one from uh, Hendrik Skoglund. And the first presentation uh, from Henning Spijakovic is the I IUF IT Commission uh, chairman. Uh, and he will talk about uh, IT in IOF events. Now, I'm, I'm not sure if Henning is uh, here or not, but he sent us a, a video of his presentation, and that means that uh, it will run from my computer, but you will not be able to, to ask questions and, uh, and raise your hand during the session. But uh, Henning, in fact, uh, promised us to be there in the end of the session, so you will be able to ask questions from him after the session. So this will run from my computer as a video. Hi, and welcome to this talk on IT in IOF events and what can the event advisor do about it? So my name is Henning Spilkovic and I'm an event advisor. I've been an assistant IT advisor at several who learned during championship and I'm an active timekeeper. 
So today's agenda is how can the event advisor be relevant? To Aaron, we don't hear anything. And the sound was I, lost. I think we lost the sound of an hour and he muted himself. Yes, that's probably right. I'll just uh, start it once again. Please add some uh, more volume to the sound. No, I'm, I'm at full, full volume. Okay, so okay. Hi, and welcome to this talk on IT in IOF events and what can the event advisor do about it. So, my name is Henning Smilkovic, and I'm a an event advisor. I've been an assistant IT advisor at several World Engineering Championships and I'm an active timekeeper. So today's agenda is how can the event advisor be relevant to the organizer? How can we establish the ambition level? We'll walk through a part of our IT checklist for event advisors. We'll talk a little bit about mitigation principles when things go wrong. A little bit about how to get or when should you get an IT advisor assistant. And finally, we'll walk through some of the supporting documentation that you can find on the IOF homepage. And first of all, we have to remember that the event advisor's role is not to be the IT expert in the organization. And for me, that could be a, can be a little bit hard. Since I'm an active timekeeper, I would love to go into the details. But when I'm an uh, event advisor, I'm not going to do the programming or the results. I'm going to help and ensure that we are in a good position to get the right results. And to once again quote the rules, uh, the IOF event advisor shall ensure that rules are followed, mistakes are avoided, and that fairness is paramount. So translate to the IT, it means that we need to ensure fair results in a timely manner without mistakes. So the main objectives of the IT area, we can say that is the fair competition for the athletes with accurate time taking and reliable punching systems. And in the cases where we choose to have it, uh, exciting love, live coverage for the spectators with arena production, internet, GPS, and so on. And these should not be contradictory with each other, but there are main stakeholders that we sometimes, uh, we will need to do trade-offs perhaps, but at least we need to ensure the relevant quality for both. A few years ago, we wrote up IT requirement specification uh, for uh, orienteering events, and there is a reference model with uh, the event administration and typically what you call the event IT in the middle, and relevant uh, aspects and data providers and equipment around this. But first of all, when you start to work with the event, you need to establish the ambition level. And this level must be aligned between the EA, the organizer, and federation sponsors and stakeholders. And I've seen several times that a mismatch here can really destroy the competition. Just as an in, we just imagine an example that let's say the mayor of the city has uh, really brought the event here and the, you might have attracted a main sponsor that thinks that this event is going on TV. Whereas the event director has almost zero budget 
and would like actually a traditional race hidden in the forest, far from any infrastructure, mobile coverage for spectators. And the event advisor would like to that the organizer hire timekeepers and GPS tracking. And maybe they all forgot to verify that there is actually 4G, 5G coverage in the forest, so the GPSs won't work, or the imagined uh, live TV control uh, legs will not work at all because there is no coverage. So getting the ambition level not right, but agree on it, aligning on it is actually the most important. And then depending on the event, there are quality levels that you need to fulfill. But most of all, I think you must decide on an ambition level before you start too much planning. And uh, there's a principle called disagree and commit. So you might not all agree, but when you have um, ended up with a decision, uh, stick to it or renegotiate if necessary. If, for instance, uh, the ambition level is too low, then there might need to even be a contract renegotiation or something. It may also be useful to communicate this in the uh, bulletins, for instance, if, if you have, especially if you deviate from uh, what would normally be expected of this kind of events. So when you find out the ambition level, then you can store, start to think about how to deliver on this, who to hire, who's going to do the job, what are we going to build to ourselves, what are we going to buy. And if you are working in the IT or uh, sector or buying IT services, you might hear, hear the word sourcing, which is where do you get uh, the people from? And you can say that there are basically two models. One is buy a service package. You hire contractors to take full responsibility for a part of your event. The other one is to do it yourself. Maybe you rent or borrow some equipment Maybe you even hire a, a consultant to be on site for you. But anyhow, it's important to define clearly who takes responsibility for the end result. We've also seen that, that some organizers have rented equipment and a consultant and have the faith or wish that the consultant will take responsibility for the end result for actually doing the job, whereas uh, the person that was hired thought that he or she would be present in the event and help if necessary. And that's really a recipe for disaster that no one believes they have the responsibility for actually doing the work or getting a correct end result. So you find this clearly. So if you buy a complete service package, um, there are some companies or groups of people that can provide all you need uh, within a certain aspect uh, in one package, like all the timekeeping, punching, uh, radio controls, for instance. GPS tracking is another very common part to outsource. Of course, this has, some, has a cost. Decide, uh, agree upon it, write it in the contract. The organizers may will probably need to supply some people to work with the provider on the day. For instance, with the GPS uh, tracking, you may need to supply people to hand out the GPSs, uh, wash vests, have them in and out, verify that the right runner has the right uh, GPS and so on. Typically, so the internal coordination between this service provider and your people is probably on your side, you have to do, but within the provider's team, the provider should do that. So if uh, uh, sport event comes with five people, you should expect them to coordinate them within themselves or a TV bus, for instance, a TV production company, 
they might have 10 to 20 people present, but they should do their own coordination. And to repeat, uh, try to make clear contracts and understand the boundaries. Mm, misalignment on the, on the expectations here is really uh, disastrous in the worst case. Yeah, the other or in a combined uh, model is to rent equipment. If you are doing a large event, you probably need more equipment than you have yourself. Then you need to rent or borrow from neighbor clubs. And if you rent, verify that the equipment works, and so on. And again, it's not the uh, event advisor's job to do this, but ensure that the organizer have an agreement on where to rent equipment and that they verify that what they rent is actually working as expected. In the case of a high profile event, so typically with broadcast TV or some other reason for this being very high profile, really, really consider the risks of using teams without experience. So uh, there might be even the reputation of orienteering in your region or country at risk. Uh, that's also costly. So sometimes uh, saving on using expertise in certain areas can be uh, more of a long-term cost than what you see just there and then. Just to give an example, um, I have this uh, table from Junior World Champs in Rairland, Norway in 2015. And different parts of the service, as you see, mm, some of it was uh, done by Amit or AT Timing at that time, um, the timekeeping, and there were two people from EQ that organized the timekeeping and they had the, the help of seven organizers. Included in this was also punch control or and the radio timing. Sometimes I think, in particular, maybe in Czech Republic and Italy, sometimes the timekeeping and the orienteering specific punch controlling has been done by separate uh, uh, companies or separate groups of people. So sometimes that is a way to split because. Um, in most countries, you can find people that can do timekeeping, but they might not know anything about orienteering. Then you can do the verification of the punches uh, separately. So even in, in World Champs 2019 in, uh, in Norway, in Oslo, uh, AMIT did both timekeeping and punch control, but in separate systems. Yeah, other aspects, the TV graphics was done by um, a group connected to the Norwegian Orienteering Federation. Same with GPS tracking was run there by the Norwegian Orienteering Federation people. And so on. So basically, you see here, here is uh, the Norwegian Orienteering Federation's experts and AMI, AQ timing. And some parts by the local organizers. But many, most of these uh, um, services or parts that needs uh, experience was done by not the local organizer, but people uh, uh, from around Norway that were uh, used to do this, used to doing this. So last uh, weekend, um, my neighbor club, Oscar Sheet Club, had a sprint extreme downhill race and uh, it wasn't very high profile, about 150 uh, kids running down a uh, outline slope. So I, the timekeeping, the punch control and the radio timing, I did at home and I had one organizer to help me with uh, reading out the cards and another organizing who ran out and placed the intermediate time boxes at the right controls. And we rented or borrowed some equipment uh, that we got just at the last moment. So we tested it a little bit, but not that much. So we actually had to run out twice to the forest to to get the online uh, splits. The speaker was not 
uh, hide. It was an uh, injured elite runner from the club. And the first aid was from external um, association, Norske Folkehjelp, that you can rent to come and uh, assist on your event. So we have developed quite a few checklists, uh, of course, in several iterations and and the follow up plan for this. And uh, this is Excel or Google Sheets based, and it has been tested and used at several World or Enduring Championships, which means that it's too big for a world ranking event. So I'll link here to a simplified version um, for world ranking events. Uh, and I have to state that this has not been tested yet at the World Ranking event. But basically, I've removed some of the completely irrelevant stuff from the World Orienteering Champs. And then it would vary a lot depending on your event, which uh, sheets and which rows you actually need to use. So there is no diploma for filling out all the fields using all the sections. Use the part that are meaningful in your case. The terminology and the parts there matches our event IT requirements document. And I think uh, or one way of using this is to have a set up a meeting, one hour meeting with uh, uh, the timekeeper probably or technical director or yeah, whoever is responsible for results and timekeeping with the organizer and walk through it and let the organizer answer. And for several of these, a not applicable or a no might be okay. It means that, okay, this part is a bit more risky, but that risk might be okay in this event, but might not be at a World or Engineering Championship. And we would expect that some other questions there would trigger a conversation about this. Uh, is this okay? Should it be better? Uh, oh, we haven't thought about it this yet. Now I'll try to demo this uh, sheet. Let's see if it works. Yeah, we got it. So follow a plan for a race. And we have put here the, the milestones. Hey, you might not need both, but sometimes you can early on sketch a high level solution. And then later on, you go into more details. And the rows here offer diff different aspects. And uh, so you might not have tracking in your event, then don't use that color. And you probably don't have TV graphics either if it's a world ranking event, so don't use it. It's, it's just to help you follow up and uh, find some questions that you might not have thought of. And there's a um, sheet for a test plan. And if so, for instance, for the race I did last weekend, I didn't test import on beforehand because I used that function in the same program against Eventor a m month ago as well. No need to test it again. Whereas if you are using IOF event or for a world ranking event for the first time, then you need to test it. And similar. You, so it's a dialogue with the, the responsible from the organizer. What is worth testing in this, in your particular case. Then we have a sheet about uh, the organization. Uh, who is the main responsible and some key roles. Um, it's good to have names uh, in due time and even a substitute for the most important uh, roles. Also have questions about external contractors. If they are hired, what are their responsibilities, written contracts and so on. Something about interfaces, event or, and in particular, are there special rules that affect this competition? Sometimes they are, and sometimes they are complicated and needs to be worked upon in beforehand. For instance, if you look at the knockout sprint uh, start uh, and group uh, setup and 
semifinals, and so on, you should not try to start reading those after the qualification. You need to understand and test them before the first, before you start, way long before you start. And we have timekeeping systems, some questions about that, punching, radio controls, maybe you don't have radio controls, just keep it, tracking, about the infrastructure, you probably, you might not have a, a huge reserve generator for power on your race, but if they are using laptops for timekeeping, that helps a lot. And it's only the network equipment you will need to plan for. Yeah, getting data out in and out of our eventer, especially for high level events, might sometimes be tricky, needs to be tested. And also uploading afterwards. Yeah, that was just a quick walkthrough of the, the sheet. We'll talk about some of the sections now as well. Yeah, so the outline there, as you saw, was a high-level solution description, if, if that makes sense. And then closer to the event, a, a detailed solution description can be useful. Covering event pre-processing, timekeeping patching, radio controls, if applicable infrastructure, handling the data and live results. And a test plan and the listing of the roles and tasks, the people who are going to work on the event. So have a dialogue on what to test when to test it. And on the sheets for the general questions and roles, look at the key roles, the assigned person substitutes and external contractors, what are their responsibilities? Do you have a contract? Or do you have experience working with this contractor? And typically there are interfaces. Uh, so look to the, or, and connections. So think about how to do backup, internet connections, event or and live results if applicable. And another reminder, check the special rules if they are applicable for your events. Also, the new, when the new rules are published, it's a good idea that the event advisor takes a look at what's changed because I know very well the rules from 2013, but there are some sub changes and it's good to know them. With regards to timekeeping, uh, these are the most important questions, perhaps what timing systems will be used. And if you do a A system and a B or a backup system, what, what are these? So in my event, uh, downhill, we had uh, tags, cards, active cards, contactless as the primary system with um, battery finish punching record it immediately, immediately on the timing uh, clock, upload it with GPRS uh, also to server side. In addition, I had video, but I did not have manual backup, uh, no extra photo cell and so on. What's the software that is going to be used? And how is it detected if one of the systems doesn't work correctly? I mean, can malfunctions are drift Thing, producing wrong times. Uh, for instance, if, if uh, one of the clocks are off by five minutes or an hour, sometimes that can cause wrong times. How do you find out what's going wrong? So, so what I usually do, both as an organizer, timekeeper, and but also as an ad advisor, I look at the first runners to the finish and manually time them. So, looking at the surface, looking at my clock that's synchronized with proper uh, master clocks, I estimate the time of the runner to the finish. And if the organizer is more than two seconds off that, I would start asking questions. 
can also be uh, worth asking how are they planning to synchronize all the clocks, start, finish, punching units. Do they have a system or is it random or is it just the same time as it was last week or three weeks ago? And if you're re really lucky, so in my last event, the, some of the online controls were still on summer time. So if we hadn't checked and fixed that, we would have gotten wrong uh, split times, which radio times, which is no catastrophe, but it destroys uh, the work for the speaker. So what are the punching systems that will be used? And if you have several uh, several events in the same weekend, will you, are there any differences? And in particular for, um, for sport events, who's responsible for programming and checking punching units before they are placed in the forest? And when is this done in advance of an event? Because with the active uh, contactless uh, controls, they are usually, they're going to sleep after a while and might need to be woken up. Also ask if they are using an approved configuration. So rule out training modes and so on, slow, slower modes of the controls. What is the backup plan? What will a competitor do if he or she doesn't register an electronic punch? In some countries, a pinch punch is uh, used as uh, this uh, backup. And finally, how uh, will the controls be verified before the rates? Woken up or verify that they are actually active. For a blood ranking event, it's important to get the entries with the correct RFID. Um, in some races, you need to do appropriate seeding according to the world ranking uh, position. Then you need and typically at a specific date. So you need to uh, download that particular list, get all the IDs for the runners and do a correct start drawing. And then of course, upload the start lists. Also after the rates, uh, upload the correct list with the correct IDs to the event board. And in my experience, you sometimes get mixed up IDs. So um, take a look at uh, that and verify them or rather get the organizers to do it, ask them how they're planning to do this verification. So let's talk a bit about the risks and mitigation. And um, when you might have heard about Murphy's law, he always shows up. So the basic principle is that any critical component must have a backup. And here are some examples. So typically the readout station is, uh, is special and if you have only one of them and it fails, you have a huge problem. So bring more than one. There might also be a special cable, for instance, going from a readout station uh, to a PC or a special USB, old USB plugs, something like that. So ask about, are there any critical components that there are? If it fails, the race will fail. We will not have results then you need to have two of those components. There could also be other finish line equipment, finish control, photo cells, that you need to have a backup or have, or have two in set out. It might be if you are searing uh, cards just before you start, or you need to have more than one in case one fails. Also, the internet connectivity, if that's a critical part of, of the event, then you might need to have two connections. I usually bring two mobile phones, one with different SIM cards. So if one provider is down, the other might still work. Also, the person that is in charge of the timekeeping Special, it's particular in smaller organizations, might be the biggest uh, single point of failure. And uh, in particular, the last uh, one and a half year, um, thinking about COVID, people might get really sick or 
being forced uh, by law to isolate, then what do you do? So that, that's a question to ask. What do you do if the main timekeeper or uh, the one who's supposed to do all the work is uh, not able to attend? But it's not only about having two pieces of equipment. So you need to know what to do if something critical fails. So contingency plans are needed. When the competition is ongoing, time can't be stopped and there is no second chance to start over. Which means that procedures need to be defined for failover process. And what other components are influenced when something fails? And are there something that needs to be redirected, for instance, cables to be changed? And failure scenarios must be tested and rehearsed in advance. So I think the, the main question is uh, basically, what do you do when this fails and have you experienced it? And if you've switched from one system to all, another system, uh, they should be, uh, the results calculated should be identical uh, between the systems uh, if, when they are healthy, of course. Yeah, an IT assistant event advisor is a concept that has been used sometimes. Um, Officially, we have several times had a specific role as an IT assistant event advisor, in particular for some high profile, high level events, uh, that is uh, World Orienteering Championships. Partly when they are very complicated, uh, you can offload the main event advisor by covering these details. Uh, there are also aspects when you are in a, a new country or where they are for inexperienced organizers in terms of uh, technical uh, details. It might be that you would like to have another uh, assistant. And basically, if the event advisor feels that a more detailed follow-up of the organizer is needed, and then what uh, the main event advisor, senior event advisor feels that he or she can do. But there are some considerations, of course, um, who decides this, who appoints. And then there's the difference between a, an official, another event advisor, and a more unofficial uh, advisor or coach or mentor for either the EA or the organizer. That can also be a solution or a, even a combination. In the World Champs in Sweden 2016, uh, I think I was assistant advisor. For <laughs> Uh, Over oh, there you want to go. Can you just mute yourself? Okay. There's always the question who covers the cost? And the, if um, there is an officially appointed event advisor by the IOF, there, this is covered by the rules. Uh, who's going to cover the costs? And it's the organizer, basically. Um, I would say that a, uh, even an IT assistant should preferably uh, at least have been a licensed event advisor so that we there is some sum of that the person knows the rules uh, and what is the role of the event advisor. But uh, if it's not a, a licensed or I've been to the uh, event advisor clinic, um, at least it needs to have experience with IT and timekeeping in sports. 
but preferably uh, I would have the combination if possible. So something about our uh, supporting documentation. Um, on the IOF homepage, on the IT uh, section there, you can find the major event IT requirements that are uh, too broad to because uh, covers too many aspects for most uh, events probably, but uh, the reference model still holds. It's just that you can scale down, you can have lower quality, you, can, you will have fewer aspects. There's also an infrastructure best practices document, and finally a uh, proven timekeeping systems uh, in orienteering uh, document. I will look a little bit into that one. So, because many organizers and event advisors wonder how to do the timekeeping and want to assure a minimum level of quality on the timekeeping. So the aim of the document is to help organizers and advisors to evaluate and choose a timekeeping system. There is definitely possible to do timekeeping with different equipment than what's documented there but it uh, would, or I would prefer that uh, the uh, organizer then provide more documentation to the event advisor and uh, explains why this can, will work. And you might even need to involve the IT commission if it's a high level event. The principles of the, this document is that we are documenting as is, so what, has be, what is being used. And we're not changing the rules there, but we might give an interpretation or a recommendation of doing something to a higher quality than what's actually required in the rules. And we're only listing systems that have been used throughout recently on high level events with documented results. And it will be revised and published, republished when necessary. So just look. Uh, just a sample table there, an overview of the requirements for different races and what kind of, of systems or you would need. So at the World Ranking event, the World Masters, uh, the result time precision is one second, which is actually for all disciplines, all formats right now. And start system is a start signal or start punch. And you need that. Finish system. You, uh, where a finish, even traditional finish punch is okay. Another table is about uh, a low profile event, let's say an internet broadcast, perhaps, but no TV. Then, is an example of uh, a race where you have transponder finish using a BS11 as a finish control in uh, touch free mode. Uh, which is then used for identification and timing. And as a system B, you have a manual backup. A document goes through several of these scenarios. So uh, to summarize this, uh, you need to do testing. And if it isn't tested, it won't work. So challenge the team to do sufficient testing. And ask good questions well in advance and uh, have a good dialogue with the people. We are working together to get to create a great race. And that finishes this presentation. And now I hope that you have some questions. Yes, thank you, Henning. This was the presentation. I see that you are here with us. Hello, welcome. Hello, hi. Okay, so we are ready for the questions for Henning.
Uh, I could first say that uh, I was a bit unclear on who covers, or I mean, the organizer covers the cost anyhow, if you want to have, an, uh, or for the advisors. The, the question is who can decide that the uh, organizer need another assistant that they need to pay for. So, because if you can do it remotely, then the costs are very low, uh, everyone involved. So that might have been a bit unclear, just to clarify the, who covers the cost of advisors is covered by the rules. Aaron, could you uh, stop screen sharing? I think we have a feedback loop through. Thank you. Thank you, Kel. OK, so any questions? Probably we will need to rely on you, Kel, to pose the first question. Yeah, OK. <laughs> of course, I have one. I, um, the, the checklist seems to be very big, I think. It uh, Henning, I, I believe it could be more a, a, a tool for the organizers. A very good tool for the organizers, but uh, less for the event advisor, for a world ranking event at least. Otherwise, you need an IT assistant at uh, event advisor for a world ranking events also. Ah, that's a good point. So, uh, also for a world champ, basically, you ask the timekeeper to fill it in. So uh, yeah, share it with the organizer. And, um, but also, we could uh, shorten it a lot down uh, with some practice. That's true. You're muted, Iron. If you say something to us. Yes, just and any more questions or comments I'm asking for. Kel again. Yes, I can continue then. Uh, one question. You, you said in your slide that the results from system A and system B should be identical. I'm not quite sure that is possible because uh, if they are really independent systems, they can't get uh, give the same result. Or they're not yeah, guaranteed right. they will give the same result. It should be equivalent uh, quality. They would probably differ a bit, and we describe how to or, uh, correct for any systematic deviance between system A and system B. But, but that's really the timekeeper's responsibility to do correctly. But uh, if there's a big difference in quality between the system, that's problematic, especially if you combine them. But uh, th there is a description on how to combine uh, results from a an A and a B system. Um, yeah. Basically, you need to uh, calculate uh, what's the difference between them and then apply that difference to the, the result that you're picking from system B. But uh, oh, that's for the timekeeper, basically. So they are not identical, but they should be of equivalent quality. It's a better phrase, I guess. Do you agree, Kel? I agree completely on that. We had we had a situation at Jaywalk in 2019 where we had to use the B system. But um... trial. Alexei, you have a question or comment? Yeah, a small question. Uh, is it your uh, hello, Henning? First, uh, is your uh, presentation uh, will be uh, available to download? I want to just to uh, check your diagram with uh, communication in the in the IT sec sector. Yeah, um, I'll send a, a PDF to Aaron, I guess, because the chat is disabled here. So I'll do that. Yes, and the whole video here will be uh, uploaded so you can you can review it. Clicking links is easier on a PDF than on a video. So. Yeah. Okay, any more questions or comments? Alexei? Yes, once again. Uh, I just remember the situation when um, uh, the punching system uh, 
was blinking and uh, I can say that uh, at, at it was really sure the punching was uh, made, but in the finish line, there were no no uh, response, no registration from the control. How often uh, this uh, case can be statistically? So when people miss a punch, they will usually claim that they saw the blink. So I do as well. Um, so for the, the most high profile events, we have used two cards now to basically settle these questions uh, better um, or with more certainty. I, um, I don't have the statistics in, uh, in top of mind. So it should be less than a percent. Um, then we do have the issue, I think, with both systems that when they are low on battery, it seems like they can blink but not record. So we need to find, um, with together with the manufacturers, find a way to uh, find out, uh, be more certain that uh, things are actually working. Um, and uh, it might be that we need to restrict how old the cards can be before races, because it seems like the measurement or the voltage of the battery isn't really good enough. It can still uh, be a problem during the race. Yeah, yeah but basically, uh, so in any, any race, there is one or two runners that can uh, claim that they are punched, but they didn't get anything. Uh, in a way that was also with the old systems. So people, with even with, with pin punch, people said, oh, I punched at the control, but there was nothing on the card. So in a way, that's not a new situation. So, but we need to monitor it. So that's why we ask for the statistics on how many disqualifications are there compared to the number of runners to see if there is a technical problem or if it's just the, the normal. We don't really remember what we did at each control, in my experience. Okay, thank you. Probably, yeah, Greg Hawthorne. You have a question or comment, Greg? Can you just unmute your microphone? The, the question that I have is uh, possibly uh, also uh, to, to go to the Rules Committee, but uh, we have the, the situation in 2019 where the uh, Russian competitors card was not uh, working uh, and that was as a result of the organizer providing the card would it not be better for the responsibility to be with the competitor and therefore you know where you know you say well you know you provide the card if it works it works if it doesn't it doesn't that's your responsibility I I, I guess uh, you know it's a question uh, to uh, to David Rosen as well as to the uh, to the IT group as well. Do you have any comment on on that uh, suggestion? Yeah, just a short comment. David Rosen is 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 not here, and uh, this was a case at the Junior World Championships in 2019 in Denmark. Back to you, Henning. Yeah, it's um, from a responsibility point of view, it's better. But if you want people to actually get results, uh, this is a bit of a hard question, which we are discussing back and forth. So, because um, using two cards quite new provided by the organizer, it's more likely that every runner should, or athlete should have a card that works, but that's quite costly. And also the value when sending these through post is uh, the insurance value is quite high. So, yeah, so we, um, um, we're discussing this, let's say, uh, say that. Yes, in 2021, in our high level events, we tried uh, the system where uh, <clears throat> the competitors could use two cards and uh, one was supplied by the organizer and the other was, was their own card, which we, be, which we thought that uh, they would uh, trust much more than, than a, a a neutral card from from the organizer who what they didn't know what what kind of state they were in and of course uh, that's why we had uh, <clears throat> uh, less disqualifications this year even with the the sport ident batteries uh, of the cyx uh, dying 
much more frequently than than previously. So actually, uh, <clears throat> we have this now for uh, 2021 for for the sport ident cards at least, and I think uh, for the emits uh, normally emit is supplying uh, uh, two cards also. Greg? Uh, well, I think that's a reasonable solution, is that if you have two cards, then the uh, yeah, you may say, well, the primary card will be provided by the organiser and the uh, backup provided by the competitor. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a, a reasonable solution. But it's more complicated for the timekeeper. So, uh... Yeah, it's pros and cons. We'll need to find how to do it. 